welcome. I think we have a, a, a very interesting event today with the um, government of Andhra Pradesh in, in India. Uh, my name is J.P. Offret, and I'm president of International Academy of CIO, and we're um, in Tokyo, um, fostering, facilitating ICT leadership and, and governance and the, and the building of ICT institutions. Um, and two of the main things we do, we do the annual WASEDA IAC digital government rankings, uh, also have an accreditation program for CIO master's degree programs, and then work with um, organizations such as uh, ITU and, and APEC and, and World Bank on, on major societal issues such as Asian society. So thank you for joining. Um, upcoming webinars that, that we have in this series, is, um, two or one is, um, well, two of the ones that are upcoming, one is on Thailand in several weeks, and then also one we're doing in partnership with Asia Development Bank um, several weeks after that. So with that, I'll, I'll turn it over uh, both um, Director of IT, Founder Pradesh, as well as uh, Professor uh, Sundar Balakrishna to introduce the speakers. Sundar. Thank you, Professor Jeet. Thank you very much for giving, giving us this opportunity, inviting us, and on behalf of the IT department, Department of Uttar Pradesh and International Institute of Digital Technologies, I sincerely thank uh, CAO for giving us this opportunity to present this webinar. Uh, we have an interesting line of uh, speakers and uh, varied topics pertaining to the coronavirus COVID-19 situation in our country. Beginning and setting the tone will be the introduction to the technology response of our state, uh, Andhra Pradesh, to the COVID-19 situation by Sri Kona Shashidhar, Indian Administrative Service, who is the Principal Secretary, IT, Electronics and Communication Department, he is also the principal secretary of real time government society and he is also the secretary of food and service supplies so he brings on to this webinar a wide and a varied experience wide and varied uh, technology responses across departments and uh, following uh, uh, shashidhar will be the seamless coordination between national and the state nation and the state by Sri J. Vidyasagar Gar, who is our IT advisor and who also leads the Real Time Governance Society. <clears throat> uh, following, the, following this talk will be the presentation of a unique dashboard for COVID 19, prepared and uh, architected by Professor Anirban Ghosh, Professor in Digital Sciences, uh, Indian Institute of Management, Vishakapatna. <clears throat> And uh, he'll be shortly going to I am Kolikod if I am if I am not wrong. Best wishes, Professor Anirban. Uh, following Professor Thank Anirban, you, yeah. following Professor Anirban's uh, uh, dashboard presentation will be myself. Uh, I will be talking about uh, mathematical models for predicting and. Uh, the predicting the COVID-19 crisis, mathematical models have taken taken hold, and they are important. They are important tools for decision makers. It decides how many hospitals should be open. It decides where or we have need to be quarantined and things like that. <clears throat> and then, cybersecurity is an important aspect, which willy nilly has creeped into the nation's priority list and talking about this topic and how it interfaces with COVID-19 will be the presentation by uh, Mr. Malikarjun, General Manager Academics. And then so far we had the administrators response and then we had the academicians take and then will be the industry response, ITEC industry response. So for that, we have Krishna Mohan from Inspirit, who is also one of our knowledge partners in International Institute of Digital Technologies. We will be talking about how COVID-19 has impacted industry, especially the private the private sector's point of view. And then we have a wrap-up session, myself and Professor G. And uh, 
and this and and thank you very much and now i invite uh, shri k shashidhar to address us well, one, one note on uh, please please write any questions you have in in the, the q and a section and then the, the chat is also uh, open too but but uh, please uh, the questions in q and a so thank you thank you thank you uh, mr sundar balakrishnan and uh, Professor Sean Afray, uh, Professor Anirban, uh, Mr. Vidya Sagar, uh, Mr. Malik Arjun, Mr. Krishna Mohan, my good friend, all the participants, uh, good evening and good morning to whatever time zone you're attending from. So it's an honor to participate in this conference. Uh, we are all passing through very troubled times with this COVID. And it's really interesting to share our experience from the state of Andhra Pradesh, how we've been dealing with this situation, how information technology has helped us so far. We would like to share our experience and also like to learn from other countries, other states, how we can cooperate, how we can collaborate, how we can learn from each other's experience and tackle this situation, which is affecting the entire mankind, cutting across all boundaries. Now coming to uh, Andhra Pradesh, this is a state in India, it's in the southern part of India. So uh, we're a quite a progressive state. Now, since the time is limited, I would not dwell much on what our state is for, but definitely some of the initiatives uh, in information technology sector that we have done. Now talking about uh, the government of Andhra Pradesh has long been at the forefront of digital initiatives. Uh, through its various initiatives such as electronic services delivery, that is taking all government services at the doorstep of people. Uh, a very innovative project called ePragati, which uh, my colleague, Mr. Vidya Sagar, our IT advisor is heading, and the Real-Time Governance Society, which is again one of its kind in the country. The government's past experience in this area has proved to be a game changer in its swift and dynamic response to the COVID-19 global pandemic. Uh, I will shortly explain what are the initiatives that we have taken. There are various departments. In fact, when we talk about the strategy to handle COVID, COVID, in fact, has affected all sections of the society, all departments in the government. So we, as Information Technology Department, we have been trying to give a backbone support to all the departments to handle their situation effectively. It's not only health. It talks about essential supplies to all the people. It talks about unemployment. It talks about uh, the regular issues which people face in terms of in times of lockdown. So all these issues have been supported by the IT department from the uh, the background. So various departments and organizations of the government have successfully launched digital platforms that help continuously and effectively monitor COVID-19 cases and symptomatic patients and ensure continuity of essential services to the citizens. While our department and its societies within the information technology department have themselves developed several innovative initiatives, especially our communications wing of this department played a very crucial role in the initiatives, which uh, my colleague, Mr. Vidya Sagar, will be able to explain how the synergy between government of India, that's the central government, the federal government, and the state government, how we work very closely in handling the situation. And uh, last but not the least, the International Institute of Digital Technologies in which uh, Professor, uh, my colleague, Sundar Balakrishna is actively involved. So they have really played a very key role in bringing all our thoughts together and making this uh, uh, webinar possible. So thanks once again to Sundar. So if we can go to the, uh, the specific initiatives, um, that slide where I'll briefly touch upon these things. And uh, Mr. Vidya Sagar will definitely elaborate on a couple of things more. First is the next, please. Next slide, please. Sundar, please tell me if I'm overshooting the time. Yeah, this is uh, the home quarantine uh, monitoring dashboard. Uh, the first initiative that we have done. Now in this one, the government of Andhra Pradesh has uh, taken up a strategy of aggressively 
uh, tracing all the contacts. So the contact tracing is visible here. Whoever has come from abroad, whoever has traveled to hotspots, now all these people have been put in home quarantine. Now this dashboard for home quarantine provides for all the people. We have 13 districts. Districts are the administrative units. Within these districts, who are the people? What is their age? Where is their location? So for the medical staff to uh, to track them and monitor them on a daily basis, this home quarantine was really useful. Next, please. Now, during lock, no, the previous one, please. Uh, emergency pass. Next one is e pass. Yeah, this one. Sorry, previous one. No, please, previous. The previous one. Yeah, this the second one. Yeah, anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll explain. So this is a Gram Award Sachivalayam application, which uh, my colleague Vidya Sagar, uh, he will explain in detail because it's a very interesting concept. It's not happened anywhere in the country. It's, it's first of its kind in the country. So uh, I think uh, more detailed presentation explanation by Mr. Vidya Sagar. Next one, please. Uh, this is the overall COVID-19 dashboard, which talks about how many active cases are there, how many are in treatment, how many are being uh, monitored. So this is uh, MIS for all the departments, particularly for the health department. So this is an integrated dashboard which we have created. Uh, in fact, while creating the dashboard itself, initial few days, we didn't have resources. Everybody was scared. So the entire work was done from home, coordinating with our software professionals who are working from different, different locations. We could be able to do this dashboard, which was quite useful and appreciated by the health department. Next, please. Uh, this is uh, the essential services, rather essential commodity services app. Uh, if I am a citizen in a particular locality of the lockdown area, if I would want to buy bread or you want to buy some groceries, I want to buy some vegetables or fruits or milk. So this app tells the citizen where such groceries, where such essential commodities are available. So this app really helped a lot of people who are forced to stay indoors to know where the particular item essential commodity was available. So all the retailers in that particular uh, locality were registered in this app. And the common man, the general public was able to see which store actually was having such and such essential commodity, which was very useful for the common public. Next, please. Uh, there are a couple of other things which I would like to, I think the slides are missing, but I will explain. There's another thing called emergency pass. As soon as I think two, three slides we have missed, uh, but nevertheless, I will explain. The e-pass is another very innovative thing where any person in lockdown who wanted to come out for emergency purpose, be it visiting the hospital or uh, coming out to buy essential groceries or traveling outside the, the state, the province, he had to apply for a pass. Initially, this was a manual process. We devised an online system where anybody can apply online and the authorities took very little time to approve his request and again intimate online to him. He just had to show his e-pass on his mobile phone to the policeman who was guarding the lockdown area and it was very convenient for the entire public. It was a seamless way of people applying and getting their pass. Next, was, uh, next is YSR telemedicine. Now, uh, when the initial phase of COVID set in, all hospitals were shut down for OP except the hospitals treating COVID patients. Now, there could be many patients who are diabetic, hypertensive, other ailments not related to uh, the COVID. Now, for these people, we have launched a special uh, platform called YSR Telemedicine with a call center and a team of doctors. All that the people have to do is just give a call to this call center and it gets tagged down to a doctor. This doctor talks to the patient. He understands the, the medical condition of the patient, prescribes a particular thing online in the package that we have developed. And this prescription goes to the nearest public office 
to the patient from where the patients the medicines are picked by a, a government functionary and are delivered at the doorstep of the patient so the entire cycle a regular patient who is not suffering from any covid but other symptoms can give a call to this call center where a doctor comes online he prescribes medicine then the medicine gets delivered at the doorstep of the the patient without any problems so this is something seamlessly done for the first time in the country it was well appreciated by all the public that uh, though all the hospitals were uh, shut uh, the government through this online platform was able to deliver the medicines to the needy patients one more initiative is chat room for general public see the health department was able to uh, start a chat room to clear the doubts regard anything the public has regarding covid you can ask anything uh, if i have a cough is it covid if i have uh, let's say running nose is it covid i have a stomach upset is it covid so anything people want to especially the young younger generation who are more it savvy they can just join into this uh, chat room and ask any question we have dedicated professionals there who answer all the questions and dispel all the fears that they have this was also uh, very useful especially the younger generation younger people who are uh, pro it and pro uh, it savvy they were able to use this facility so all these initiatives uh, the it department was able to support all departments be it uh, the movement of essential supplies or the health core activities or non core uh, health activities or engaging the general public or surveillance or contact tracing so we are very happy that so far the uh, our department it department was able to play a very important role and uh, apart from this we are continuously learning from international experiences uh, thanks to uh, international academy of cios we are able to share our experience now and on a daily basis we are we are trying to learn which are the best practices there is also something called aragya setu which my colleague mr vidya sagar will explain how it has helped us in actual contact tracing and on a daily basis how it it keeps on uh, uh, tracking the people who are going to hot spots who are prone to such uh, infections and alerting the people very one very interesting uh, last uh, thing which i would like to share is any person who goes to a medical shop a pharmacist without any intimation to the authorities and says Uh, in india we have this practice that many uh, rural folk they go to a pharmacist directly and uh, even without the knowledge of a medical practitioner they go and ask uh, can i get a medicine for let's say running temperature can i get uh, a medicine for let's say a running nose or a sore throat now this pharmacist immediately he feeds this information into an online platform and this goes to a medical nearby medical a practitioner government authority they go to this person and say it seems that you have uh, you went to this pharmacist for a medical for some essential medicines so we would like to test you so like this we were able to aggressively do testing in fact andhra pradesh state has the highest per million tests being conducted on a daily basis in the country that proved very effective and all these initiatives has helped the health department to do this kind of uh, aggressive testing and contact tracing so these are some of the initiatives from it department uh, since the time is limited uh, sundar i think i'll stop here and i'll also uh, request uh, when mr vidya sagar is talking to throw more light on what we have done from the it department so thank you once again everybody thank you yeah, sir thank, thank you very much sir. we do have two um two interesting questions um one is on the uh, e passes whether you're able to um monitor the traffic patterns to avoid congregations of greater than than 10 or 50 people in a marketplace and then the second question was whether um the the IT department engaged uh healthcare professionals to support the uh that engagement uh the first one uh is regarding e pass and how uh, whether whether is there any uh traffic or whether is there any uh waiting period is it is that the question if i'm right well, e, e pass and, and and being able to to monitor or or know that that groups are greater than 50 or 100 are gathering in a marketplace uh 
these two are two different things one is e pass is for an individual person to go okay. out even during lock lockdown situation police doesn't stop him it's a permit for him to go and travel so that's the uh, e pass system regarding 50 or 100 people gathering uh, we have a different system of uh, reporting because uh, in the uh, mm, the it interventions that we have done now there are uh, two places in which we have put up sensors <coughs> where uh, if the number of people were going beyond the permitted limited it could alert the police uh, we have not listed that in our explanation today but yes we have done it on a small scale but otherwise uh, the e pass system was meant for permits a person to travel even during restrictions yeah. what uh, was the second question uh, it, it was in regard to, to the the chat room the um comment was it's a great idea and, and also asks whether um you engaged uh, healthcare professionals uh, for the which part the healthcare uh, professionals uh, were the, involved the chat, the chat room. all through all through the oh. healthcare professionals were engaged all through for example the uh, the telemedicine that i was talking about the telemedicine part has doctors from all over the state who voluntarily registered online today i let's say i'm a healthcare professional in a far off place 400 kilometers away i have two hours spare time i voluntarily offer my services to the government i say between 4 and 6 pm i am available i log in first i register today i am available 4 to 6 i log in into the system and i am available so when a caller calls to this call center it gets routed to this person who is voluntarily offering his services so that way we were able to open a lot of medical professionals all over the state who offered uh, their services free of cost to the general public this telemedicine is revolutionary game changer which we have experienced now any person having any kind of problem other than covid was able to talk to a doctor immediately within minutes and then get a prescription and also get his medicine delivered at his doorstep so this is this was very effective thank you very much um thank you okay. Well, Sundar, would you like to uh, introduce Mr. Vidyasagar? Yeah, <clears throat> sir, thank you very much for giving us a wonderful introduction to our state IT initiative, sir. Now we move on to our second speaker, Sri J. Vidyasagar, who is our IT advisor and the chief executive officer of the Real Time Governance Society. He also heads uh, e Pragati, which is a state enterprise wide architecture setup for our state. He will be talking about seamless coordination between national and local governments of the COVID-19 response. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Sundar. Uh, thank you, Professor Afray. And uh, I'd like to thank uh, Sri Shashidhar Garu for giving uh, an excellent summation of what the department has been doing across the state. Um, our uh, chief executive, Chief Minister Sri Jagan Mohan Reddy Garu, he believes that uh, technology is a tool to support other professionals as well as the government organizations to provide services and to help them uh, carry out their responsibilities more effectively and efficiently. And that's what we have done. Here, um, Government of India, which is the federal government, has a national level response that they have designed and have updated us throughout the pandemic on a weekly basis, if not more frequently when required. The state and the local governments, as you are aware, one size does not fit all, uh, have to have their own uh, tailored responses, as well as implement the policies that the federal government has instituted. So when a, a host of complex policies, such as restrictions on public transport or international travel, monitoring, school closures, workplace restrictions, ban on public gatherings, as well as allowing the emergency as well as essential services throughout the supply chain to continue to operate as well as support the public. So closing some things while making sure that the other things are uh, operating. And this requires a uh, pretty complex infrastructure as well to implement successfully. And that's what we have done. 
So the state government has again empowered the district. District is the next level below the state level for uh, administrative purposes. So the state is divided into multiple districts. The response has been calibrated by district, looking at the severity of the cases found as well as the population that is in at risk demographic. So in alignment with our uh, government strategy, what have we done? Uh, continued the containment measures, ensured that the public uh, health and safety measures were appropriate, and also ensured certain policy responses, making sure that the MSME is, I think, micro, small, medium enterprises. So this is small businesses. They received economic packages to make sure that their uh, cash flow issues and challenges are addressed door delivery of pension payments for the elderly, essential food services for the needy, as well as emergency cash payments. Now imagine this, this is not quite a cashless society like uh, the Western world is. So the cash payments to poor needy as well as the migrant laborers that were in the state, that was done through the volunteer system, which we'll talk about in a second. You can go to the next slide, please. So the, in addition to technology, what helped us successfully navigate the troubled waters is the volunteer system. This is again the brainchild of our uh, chief minister, where approximately half a million, uh, it's a little over somewhere between 450,000 to 500,000 volunteers, as well as the village and ward level. Village is the rural uh, local governance unit. Wards are the similar equivalent for urban uh, areas. This is a system that has been instituted during the first uh, few months of the new government. And along with um, ASHA workers, these are uh, social health activists and nurse midwives, ANM. <clears throat> this organization has been working tirelessly throughout the pandemic to address not only taking care of the medical aspects and public health safety aspect, but also take care of the uh, social security network as well as the safety network for the citizens to make sure that they receive all the services they need during the emergency situation. So volunteers in the rural areas are one approximately for 50 households. And in urban areas, one volunteer for approximately 100 households. So these volunteers, along with healthcare workers, were monitoring the health of citizens, particular attention during the early days for foreign returnees. So who came from where, where are they located, and are they exhibiting any symptoms, and are they staying in self-isolation if necessary? Do they require medication? All aspects of this. Next slide, please and reporting this data on mobile apps. They, they all were given uh, smartphones by the state government. So they were reporting the data through a mobile app, which centrally could be uh, converted to useful information and shared with the state government officials. <coughs> so contract uh, tracing is the obvious thing that we talked about. Um, the technology we use for that is interesting. We work with uh, cell phone carriers to identify, triangulate the location of the phones. As people move about, we could track their phone movement. People who are supposed to be in quarantine, if they're moving away from their location, more than a certain distance, we would receive alerts. Those alerts would then result in us sending SMS text messages to the individuals to ensure that they stay where they're supposed to, as well as <coughs> notifying the nearby authorities to situation like this so they can take uh, control of the situation. And this is one way of keeping track of uh, large gatherings. So uh, other, some of the other technologies, checkpoints. So the, the traffic, uh, since the public migration or movement of uh, people traffic is restricted during checkpoints on the roads, uh, another technology in initiative to make sure that we are monitoring using drones in um, market yards and places like that to ensure that there's no uh, crowds and the people who are uh, allowed to go at certain times uh, are actually following the social distancing norms. These were some of the other uh, other technology initiatives that help us uh, during this time. 
because of how well the volunteers and the village and ward secretariat system function, we could eliminate uh, gaps as well as overlaps in multiple teams and share information in real time to the necessary officials so they could perform their job. <coughs> Initially, there was a question if uh, healthcare uh, professionals were involved. We had the state command and control center, which is a cross-functional team uh, made up of high-level state government officials and their uh, corresponding district level control rooms which were working 24-7 in shifts to make sure that the information dissemination, the organizational controls that need to be in place, decision making and help where it is needed were all being done uh, as soon as possible in real time. And essential services, so if uh, people who could not go out needed uh, food items, those were door delivered by the volunteers. So this organization, was instrumental in making sure that we were able to handle this thing with minimal disruptions. Next slide, please. So emergency management system and identifying the, <coughs> the vulnerable pockets of population, the high risk demographics, these are all the, the focus areas which helped us to respond to this challenge uh, as soon as we identified that they were arising. So e-pass system, Shashidhar Garu mentioned it, this is more like a travel pass. During um, serious lockdown, people were not allowed to go out. And we realized that there were certain uh, members of the society that had to, for whatever reasons, for example, truck drivers, you know, they are transporting food, essential commodities. And then the supply chain, you know, gas stations, service stations, um, food stores on the way where the highway stops, where the, the drivers needed to stop, manufacturing facilities, food processing factories, farmers, vegetables, uh, fruits, vendors who uh, save, sell these things as well as transport them. These were all the necessary functions even during this time. So all these people were allowed to function normally. The others, if they needed to go with good reason, required e-pass. So that's the technology area where they would apply online. We would send the pass to their smartphones. They would have a QR read uh, code. So police who would stop them would be able to read the QR code and realize that they had a pass and they could move through. Um, this is an area where without this uh, technology, imagine doing all these things on paper or manually, it would have been a huge challenge. So similarly, um, uh, what was the other thing? So the, the testing, tracing, and treating, the triad was followed very strictly. Where there was uh, any doubt, people could self-report or other people could report them. They, had, they were provided with facilities to take them securely, safely to testing facilities, testing labs. And if the test results came positive, they were taken to uh, hospitals that were designated for treatment. This entire process of hospital management, patient management was done, was provided to the health department by IT uh, teams. Writing code, developing applications, mobile as well as web-based in as short time as some things, few hours, most things in a couple of days. And supporting the functioning of the health department to address this uh, pandemic. Next slide, please. So we have done, uh, one other thing we have done is um, surveying uh, using call centers, IVRS automated, as well as going door to door. Now that the volunteers serve 50 to 100 households, they're a known commodity. They have a relationship and trust factor. So volunteers would go and conduct door to door surveys, asking for information that the state level officials deem necessary during this uh, period. So getting information from them and doctors were being uh, sent to infected people's or suspected uh, infection people's homes to treat them confidentially. So there is no social stigma associated with that. That was another reason why most people felt uh, comfortable sharing information with the volunteers, knowing that the information remained confidential. Now keep in mind, there's no equivalent of HIPAA loss here. So the, it required the trust factor by the volunteers as well as 
the actual execution in practice where we were keeping this information confidential to build trust among general public. So the after I think a couple of months of um, the process, uh, we had central government, the federal officials coming down to check how the state governments function. And as part of that uh, extensive presentation, including data, metrics, and the results were uh, provided to the team that came from uh, central government. And AP government's efforts as one of the, I think we were in the top two or top three in most of the categories, number one in testing, um, second in uh, control and similar uh, metrics. And this is something we can look back and say we have done a great job using the technology as well as the volunteer and local level secretariat system that was instituted in place. I stop the presentation now and if there are any questions either now or later, we'd be happy to respond to that. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have a question from Mr. Gurpreet Singh in regard to the, the privacy of health data and then also related to uh, security and, and, and background checks on the volunteers. Sure. Uh, so the secure the privacy and security of healthcare data. Now, since the organizations that provided the software that collect this information, process the information, provide analytics, modeling, and provide insights to the officials, these were the two uh, agencies within the IT department. So it's safe to say that they would follow the instructions and keep the data secure. So we were using. Um, real-time governance society as well as e-pragati authority to develop the software and to provide analytics teams would be co-located with the health department officials health commissioner for example and provide to him the reports and analytics that he required in real time so data privacy is of paramount importance and security of the information we collect uh, not just patients but general public as well so who are the volunteers who are they serving what surveys have they done? What's the data coming back? All this thing is kept confidential and secure. Um, you also mentioned about the background screening of the volunteers, right? So this is an initiative that has happened over the past. Uh, the vision and the brainchild of our um, chief minister Garu was to uh, provide the volunteer system. So this happened not during the rush of the pandemic, but beforehand. So during August through October of last year, 2019 that is, this uh, approximately are more than 400,000 volunteers and the village and ward level functionaries were screened, hired, trained and put in place. So because the system pre-existed and was there to help us, we were able to take advantage of that to execute what we wanted to do during this period. I hope that answers the question. Yes, th thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you sir. Yeah, thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we saw the first two presenters <coughs> telling us about a slew of initiatives taken by the government of Andhra Pradesh. This was also reflected in the statistics <coughs> borne out by the national media. Against an infection rate of we are reaching something like four lakh ninety five, five lakhs in our country today. <coughs> Whereas in AP, the number of infection cases has crossed 10,000. And daily infection around 140, 150 in our state of AP versus 17 to 18,000 in the country. So the, all these measures have been possible because of the initiatives the state has been able to take so far. Future, of course, nobody can predict. <clears throat> but as on the date we stand, we the numbers look supportive to the initiatives we have taken. <clears throat> More on this on the interesting COVID-19 tracker uh, of uh, about which Professor Anirban Ghosh from IIM Vishakhapatnam will be speaking about. On to you, Professor Anirban. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, so yeah, uh, thanks uh, everybody. Thanks for inviting me uh, and uh, to all the attendees. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, so. What we will be talking about, I will be talking about now, is a certain kind of tracker that we have developed for, uh, from within uh, uh, Shakhapatnam Indian Institute of Management, 
and uh, <coughs> this tracker is kind of uh, um, a unique, a unique, a unique tracker in a sense that uh, this. I mean, uh, Ben, can you can you just uh, shift the presenter um, privilege to me so that I can go through the tracker and actually talk about it in more detail that why it is. Yes, sure, Anna Ben. Um, you do have a little bit of echo to your uh, voice. It's uh, if it if it continues, I would recommend using your computer uh, mic. Okay, uh, so um, please stop me if it is if there's an echo which is disturbing. Uh, so I will uh, shift to a, a different microphone. But for now, let's let me just go ahead with this. So this is a tracker which is a dashboard for prediction and control assistance. It's uh, it's pretty detailed uh, in various terms. So on the left hand side, you can see the there's there some four tabs. One is a summary tab, one is a state wise count, one is a reproduction rate, and another is a predictive modeling. So the summary is uh, basically the thing that almost everyone is doing. There's, there's a list of trackers. There's not a lot of trackers actually that exist in the country right now. And this is just one of them. It takes the data from uh, publicly available sources and it lists them what is the number of confirmed cases active cases, the recovered cases, and the death. And uh, actually, you can see in the map, uh, you can see that uh, uh, it's a gradation in the color, and you can actually select the variable to display. You can see confirm, or you want to see active, and also all of these are uh, uh, pretty conveniently displayed here. So there is something that is important to mention here that most of the trackers that are used currently are thinking in terms of depicting or visualizing in terms of numbers. Now, uh, COVID-19 is a very specific kind of disease which has shocked us all in its contagious. So uh, not only numbers are important, but how close are the numbers are, how close are the cases are to each other, how close the fact people are. That is very important because the, most, uh, the, the, the more they are together, the more the chance of spreading. So that, that's why we have uh, uh, that. So that's why you can see that type of transformation, you, you have a cases per area. So if there's only count of cases, you can see that this uh, state, Maharashtra, is leading the country uh, in the number of cases. But the moment you change it to cases per area, you will see that this small uh, area of New Delhi is actually the most vulnerable area because it has more number of cases back in a very small, um, a, a very small area. So the, the, the chances of explosion in terms of contagion is very high uh, in case of these. So here also we have a gradation. And you can actually uh, look, go into any, any display and you can see the same kind of gradation, same kind of understanding. You can go to, let's say, what we Andhra Pradesh, you can go to Andhra Pradesh and see uh, which districts are basically the uh, districts have the most number of cases per area, uh, active cases. Similarly, you can see which, uh, uh, which basic areas have more number of deaths per square kilometer. Now, deaths per square kilometer is not a very uh, exciting metric, but uh, nonetheless, it is there. So this is one part of the summary statistics. Uh, and also we have the state-wise counts where you can have the uh, graph. Uh, you, you can actually select which states you want. And Ben, I'm yeah. sorry to interrupt. Can you uh, exchange your mic? Uh, the, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. Too disturbing. Yeah, I'm doing it. How about this now? Uh, so far, so good. We'll see. I'll, I'll let you know. No problem. So uh, for now, I mean, so 
Here we can add states for the, for the sake of comparison. We can actually uh, add whichever state we want. For example, if we want to uh, compare Andhra, uh, Andhra Pradesh, and Karnataka. So here it. So these are the these are the number of confirmed cases by states and how it is going. Uh, you can, if you want, you can change it into logarithmic scale to see a different approach here. And here is the number of new confirmed cases by states per day. So one, one metric is number of new confirmed cases, but more than the number of confirmed cases, because number is something that is related to uh, a population. And second, the extent of testing. So numbers are directly correlated to testing. So the more you test, the more numbers are there because the, the disease is prevalent in the society right now. So uh, the numbers may not give you a lot, but what can give you a lot is if you want to see percentage changes. If you want to see percentage changes, you can see that the percentage changes are a lot here, but then the percentage changes had basically uh, kind of uh, settled down here. You can, you can zoom in here and, and see how the percentage changes are going on. So this is the state-wise count for confirmed cases. You can do the exact same thing for active cases. You can do that for uh, you know recovered cases and death cases. So all of these are the state-wise counts which is there. Now the interesting thing that this dashboard offers is something called reproduction rate. So reproduction rate is a, in my opinion, it's a, it's a single most important metric when you're dealing with a contagion. Because reproduction rate says that at a given period of time, uh, what, uh, what is the ratio between the number of people infected and number of people recovered? So if more number of people are more number of people are recovered than infected, then the contagion is under control. But if more number is infected than recovered, then it is basically spreading. So it's an epidemic. So tracking the reproduction number is very important. So in this reproduction rate uh, uh, tab, we have we are tracking the reproduction number for the whole India, and we can we can do it for any state. And also the unique feature of this is we can do it for any district as well. So we can see that let let's say for the state of Andhra Pradesh, if we zoom in here, you can see that the reproduction rate is around 1.2 right now. So if it is 1.2, that means it is still in an epidemic phase. It hasn't gone down uh, below one yet. Uh, now, this is a state level uh, uh, diagnostics and we can go to the district level. Let's say uh, I am from the district of Vishakhapatnam. So we can uh, see the check, select Vishakhapatnam district and see how the uh, reproduction rate has changed over the time. And uh, we can see here, and uh, so it is 1.34 right now in Vishakhapatnam district. It's a bit higher than the state average uh, reproduction rate. And the primary reason for this is a lot of people are coming in. It's, it's a very, it's a city. It has an international airport. So, uh, so basically a lot of people are coming in from foreign countries, from other states, they're coming in. And some, they are, they are bringing in the, 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 the infection. So, so that also is a reason that this is uh, this is increased in Vishakhapatnam. Okay, so fine. So let's uh, go to the predictive modeling phase right now, which is also a very interesting part of this uh, interesting aspect of this uh, tracker. So let's see. I can I can actually select you know all India. And I want to see what is the prediction of COVID-19 spread for all India. <clears throat> we are using a certain epidemiological model called extended <clears throat> SIR model, susceptible infected recovered extended SIR model, and we are doing that for the whole India. And there is something that when should I lift the lockdown? So I can choose between three options, 31st May, 14th June, or 28th June. So I can select anything. I want and see what is the effect of removing the lockdown and also select type of social distancing after the lockdown is lifted. So also after the lockdown is lifted, we can go by the China model, like we have strict social distancing even after the lockdown is lifted, or we can we can basically do a minimal kind of social distancing, you know, like hotels and all uh, academic institutions, uh, 
night clubs those things are closed cinema halls those things are closed but people can move around uh, keeping social distancing that that's something that is the the what we call as minimal social distancing or they can go back to earlier normal which is no social distancing so if we go for the no social distancing it says that the estimated date when the number of infection is maximum that is the date from which the number of infected persons should start to decline is 9th september in case of no social distancing and here it is and it is it, it's a huge number you can see over it's a huge number of infected persons so what i want to remind the audience here that this number is actually the actual prevalence of the disease it, it might not show up because a country might have a lot of uh, constraints in terms of its infrastructure in terms of the covid uh, in terms of the tests that it can actually do it has a constraint it cannot it's it's a huge country so we cannot actually test everybody so we have to have our own testing strategy the icmr testing strategy has been changing throughout the uh, throughout the weeks even so uh, if we can so this number will be realized if we actually test everybody in the country in case of no social distancing if we change to minimal social distancing you will see that it will start to decline from 22nd september 2020 uh what happens if we go to strict social distance it says that this situation is not possible since at the end of lockdown period which i have selected here the such social distancing measures were not seen in people's behavior so we cannot do strict social distancing based on because what i mean is that when we lift the lockdown the reproduction number is bound to increase so strict social distancing is not possible if if the kind of strict social distancing that i'm talking about was not even there before the lockdown or during the lockdown so it is not possible so this is uh, something that let's say uh, we are doing it for the whole india now in the case of andhra pradesh we can do it for the whole state of andhra pradesh uh, to the district but i'm choosing the whole state for now strict social distancing definitely not possible but minimal social distancing yes it is possible it says that 16th august is the date where we estimate the infections will start coming down 16th august with minimal social distancing the infections will start coming down i have selected the lockdown period as 31st may because that's when actually the lockdown is set and unlock 1.2 started so minimal social distancing yes it says that 16th august it should uh, come it should start coming down and uh, something which is interesting that we can actually go by the district so we can let's say i am talking about my district here vishakhapatnam we can uh, okay let's let's look at vishakhapatnam it says that vishakhapatnam the date from which the number of infected persons will start to decline is 26 july 2020 so it's not very far away so we are we are expecting that we will probably in a month exactly a month from now uh, the number of infections should uh, start coming down so this is something that is uh, that is something we expect the team which developed here uh, so we have in our team we have uh, two faculty members so i am a former faculty member of i am vishakhapatnam and there is another faculty member from shivshan prasing patel and there are two students of indian statistical institute for the shivshan vidya and shivshanji who have assisted us in this uh, dashboard so we want we really urge maybe through this uh, platform right now uh, to uh, the ministry of uh, the, the government of andhra pradesh that we can actually make use of this tracker and to the i mean it is it is detailed up to the district level so district authorities can use the tracker to understand what is the scenario of reproduction rate right now in the state so do we need for a more strict approach or can we unlock more Uh, so all of these policy decisions can be made possible through this uh, tracker so that's uh, that's what i wanted to share um, if you have any any questions i would be happy to yeah, th- th- thank you very much we'll, we'll take questions at the um, end because of the um, echo so with that i'd like to turn it over thank you very much for an excellent presentation on the tracker turn it over to uh, sundar about krishna and to discuss our modeling and thank you yeah. can we have the uh, thank you professor anirban for sharing the tracker uh, it talks a lot about metrics 
and it will be more about metrics from my side now we will be drilling down more into the mathematics of covid-19 modeling which will be of some interest to academicians who are a part of this audience okay <clears throat> the uh, can we have the presentation Tom, Tom, can you please um, reset the content? Yeah. I'm sorry, JP, what were you saying? Can you please enable me to share content again? Oh, sure, yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> Uh, yeah, next slide, please. To understand the mathematics behind it, I think we should go in for some more context. And uh, all this started in December 2019 in the Hubei province of China. And the International Committee on the Taxonomy of Viruses announced this as a new coronavirus severe acute respiratory syndrome, CV2. Now, now, the whole point behind me discussing this is the coronavirus 2 is not new to humankind. Medical researchers believe that this is somewhat related to a coronavirus carried by the Chinese bat, but it is yet to be confirmed. But the coronavirus 2, SARS-CoV-2, which we are dealing with, is somewhat similar to SARS-CoV, which first occurred in November 2002 in Guangdong, China. It is also very similar to the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, MRS, mers cov which occurred in 2012 in Saudi Arabia, Middle East, and South Korea. At present, we have two broad mathematical models to deal with this epidemiology. One is a deterministic model, and the other is a stochastic model. Next slide, please. Uh, Professor Anirban is mentioning about CERN, okay? the e -cell. Previous slide, please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Why mathematical models are important? Because based on calculus, based on statistics, based on probability, many of the knowledge we get from mathematical models are the driving forces behind policies. They tell us how much hospitals we have to equip, how much businesses we are shutting down, how many movements of people we are restricting. But what exactly is a predictive model? It should be predictive in the sense, it should give people a very realistic sense of what will happen if they don't change their behavior. It should also give them a very persuasive picture of outcomes they can achieve if they do. Something very similar to what Professor Anirban was talking about in the tracker model. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Previous, yeah, <clears throat> yeah. Uh, Professor Anupan was mentioning the SER model. The SER is a very popular deterministic model which talks about susceptible cases, infected cases, and the removed cases. Susceptible cases are those who have not yet contacted the virus, but they are potentially capable of getting infected. Infected cases are those that have already who have contacted the cases and removed. The virus is likely to lead to two scenarios. One, either the person recovers or the person dies, and both of it are equally treated in the SER model. The crucial parameter here is the basic reproduction number, which is the average number of people each contagious person is likely to infect. If the virus is very highly contagious and it faces no obstacles, like coronavirus in the beginning, the R0 is greater than one, an infected population will grow exponentially, collapsing all of our hospital systems. If people start wearing masks, keep their distances, then R0 is likely to below below one and cases decline. Now, the deterministic model puts all cases in three buckets, the susceptible, infected, removed, and the analysis carries on from there. So as a matter of prediction, it is proved that it does not do such a good job. Now we will move on to a more <coughs> rigorous stochastic model. The, the next slide, please. Here, 
the number of infectious cases is treated as a function of time and of t and initially when a virus strike occurs people lack complete knowledge of its origin and without control the growth rate of infection goes very fast this we regard it as a constant or not however after a period of time people start begin uh, uh, attention they devote attention to the disease they take measures and therefore the growth rate of infected people now decreases with the increase in the number of n that is the growth rate r of n can be expressed as a monotonically decreasing function of n that is i have displayed it in bold r of n is nothing but r not which is a constant indicating the growth rate of people doing nothing which is at the beginning and that reduced by s yes, which is the infection inhibition constant which is a function of what people and government does which reflect the effect of control and when the infected rate of people n reaches n max that is all people in a locality say there are 100 people in a locality 50 are potential infection uh, infection sensitive and this will be n max so when n max is reached R of n automatically is zero. This is a logical assumption of the model. Next slide, please. So, with these basic facts, I am now setting up my differential equation with the initial condition, dn by dt, which represents the number of newly infected persons delta n within the time delta t, which is a product of R not, that is the infection rate with people doing nothing, and the balanced number of people who can be infected that is 1 minus n by n max into n my initial condition is n of t not is n not and this ordinary differential equation if i solve i get the initial solution as n is equal to n not into e to the power of r not into t minus t not <coughs> uh, for passage of time we will i am only going to broadly state these results with equations 1 and 2 we need to find out two parameters that is n the number of infectious persons and t that is the time for infection to double from n to 2n next slide please and here using the principles of maxima i solve the differential equations and i arrive at the solution that when n is n max by 2 that is n max is the maximum number of people that can be pop that can be infected if n, if n is equal to n max by 2 we reach the inflection point that is a maximum number arithmetically we are proving that this is the maximum number where there can be no more change in dn by dt next slide please besides n we also need to <coughs> find out the time span t in which the number of infections increases from n to tn i will not go through the whole development of the solution but equation 6 gives me the time for the infected cases to reach from n to 2n the point to note here is t is by default positive because the expression within logarithm n max minus 2n divided by 2 into n max minus n is guaranteed to be less than 1 and logarithm of any positive no any fraction is a negative number and therefore t by design will be a positive number next slide please now using these expressions for n and t data is taken from the national health commission and the people's republic of china the regions chosen for covid 19 are the hubei guangdong zhejiang and the henan provinces of china and for sars which appeared in 2023 again i am taking some provinces from china guangdong beijing and hong kong for mers outbreaks this analysis takes four cycles of infection one in 2014 and another in 2015 next slide please uh this is a slightly involved table but the point here is column number 4 and 5 which tells the predicted number 
and the fifth column tells the actual number why i am taking mass and sars also into consideration is to to prove the robustness of the model and in the last column we see that the average relative error rate is just between minus 0.18 to 3% which shows that the model is fairly robust next slide please and the growth rate for covid which is the first graph followed by sars and mers the growth rate interestingly is between 0.2 to 0.3% showing that it is much more efficacious than sars which was only between 0.1 and 0.15 even for mers the ratio is between 0.1 to 15 the last graph that is a fourth graph gives us all this in one graph again which shows that the growth rate for covid 19 is twice as much for mers and sars which shows that covid is highly infective next slide please the multiplication cycle that is the time taken for the disease to go from n to 2n we see that in the last graph you will see that the time taken for covid 19 is just between 2 to 3 days whereas for sars and mers it is between 5 to 10 days which shows that the multiplication cycle is extremely high for covid 19 which shows that the multiplication is very fast next slide please i was talking about the infection inhibition constant uh in the for the covid 19 case in the hubei province the the infection inhibition constant was extremely low and therefore the disease outbreak was very high further lessons in guangdong zhejiang and henan showed that the infection inhibition constant has grown up and thereby the control was able to be substantially good in the last graph again we see that the infection inhibition constant for saudi arabia during mers was the best the saudi arabian government took extremely good measures and in comparison for coronavirus 2 the situation has not been that good next slide please and a similar study was done for india and here are some of the basic the basic reproduction number that is the number that a infection person can infect others which is 1.55 so the epidemic doubling rate is as low as 4.1 days and the infected to quarantine that is infected is potentially infected to actually infected is 10 to 1 this shows that uh the testing rate has not been that that good in our country or perhaps it could also be due to a lot of asymptomatic cases now my principal conclusions here are the stochastic mathematical models have been useful to a certain extent in that their predictions have been fairly good but certain curve fitting models have given us some spectacularly stupid projections also for example one that white house used reportedly predicted that covid 19 threats to decline to zero in 10 days in june and we have the reality which we are seeing now so by construction they simply assume that past will be future will be like the past so with this conclusions <clears throat> i conclude my presentation on the mathematical models where we talked about deterministic and stochastic and as concluded the stochastic models are more fairly robust now i questions we will take in the later phase and now we will i invite uh, shri mallikarjun to give us some aspects about cyber security challenges um, malik you're on mute hello yeah hello ma'am hello am i audible yes yeah okay thank you sirs on behalf of iidt for the opportunity as part of this important event technology and the state experiences in corona virus response the case of andhra pradesh india <clears throat> i would be discussing the topic cyber security challenges posed by covid 19 actually the covid 19 pandemic has forced us and mass 
to turn into a remote worker. This sudden shift in the way we work has expanded the threat landscape. The threat landscape has changed so much that conventional security is not enough. Employees are the new perimeter for security. Now the employees are not sitting at the office. Now they are a distributed workforce. Attackers too also have not been left untouched by the pandemic. And we have seen a sharp rise in phishing scams in the last five months. It is observed that attacks which were COVID-19 themed, including phishing and brute force rose as much as 100%. In the last five months, we have seen an increase in botnets, crypto miners, and banking trojans. This new normal of working remotely has hazened the digital transformation of organizations and we we'll see an increased effort to shift towards cloud and mobile solutions. Applications, data, users, and their devices are moving outside the zone of control and the organization's perimeter. The work from home culture it presents insiders with a bigger opportunity to breach security controls, controls due to or limited. Yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt, but slides are not moving in tandem with your talk. Yeah, uh, this is the actually this is the introduction. Uh, uh, so now I am I am moving to the education sector. Now coming to the education sector that, uh, on the previous uh, previous slide, please. Due to the peculiar situation of COVID nineteen, classroom teaching has completely moved to online teaching. Though education cannot be automated fully, certainly a blend of online and offline teaching is going to be the trend in the years to come. In such circumstances, it is paramount on our part to protect the next generation, the most vulnerable from the effects of the cyber attacks. Let us see the pros and cons of online teaching through virtual sessions. So what are the advantages of previous slide, please? What are the advantages of the online uh, learning through virtual classrooms? Yes, it's, it's, it has streamlined the registration and scheduling process. The stakeholders can collaborate effortlessly. The facility of online sessions eliminates or minimizes the need to travel. Availability of learning collaterals to participants 24 by 7. Participants can access and learn as per their convenient timings. The best teacher or subject matter expert can be allocated to all the learners as the virtual classroom capacity is much more than that of a physical classroom. Teacher can improvise and deliver session in an interactive manner where every learner can participate. Some of the shy students will feel bold now to participate in class activity as they cannot see the intimidating presence of other smarter learners. Actually, this is the feedback which we got from our uh, students of IIDT. And uh, student engagement can be effective using test and polls. We can encourage small group interactions with breakout sessions. So what could be the other side of the coin? What could be the cons of the uh, online learning? Yes, learners now online would, will find it difficult to focus. The fac faculty cannot see the learners. The faculty cannot pull up the having students and many a time when open questions are asked, no one in particular responds. And it is difficult to hold participant attention. And also the uh, technical challenges which students have faced is that uh, they require a Wi-Fi connection with sufficient bandwidth and signal strength from the service provider is a challenge. And good laptop, desktop tab with compatible browser or wire should be there. And familiarity with the usage of the particular online tools. It's like they should know how to chart and the, how to raise their hand and ask the questions. So, uh, um, so uh, lots of earlier assumptions which were there in the pre-COVID era, they are no longer valid. It's like uh, 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 the uh, the uh, all the students are not within the perimeter of the classroom. Earlier, the participants used to be in front of the teacher. It's no longer there. And uh, uh, the, is the new perimeter is as secure as the pre-COVID perimeter. So what is the 
challenges to adoption how we can align cyber security with the new normal that is work from home or work from anywhere any anywhere next slide please but you have you should wrap up in the next two minutes <laughs> okay sure uh, so what are the uh, fresh cyber security challenges we have we should have we should protect the participants from the cyber attacks how it's a, we should have a work from home policy and which is standardized and organization concern should be there like there should be clear guidance from the organization on what is allowed when working remotely it's regarding printing cameras microphones use of social media and accessible websites and providing advice concerning smart devices in the home such as alexa and smart tv and uh, there, there should be a refresh of a security awareness training on phishing scams specific to the current situation next slide please next slide so uh, as uh, earlier uh, i mentioned there is a upsurge in phishing attacks and it is important to step up awareness of digital security during this time as we have already seen an increase in phishing attacks. We recommend as far as possible not to mix work and leisure activities on the same device and be particularly careful with any males reference in the coronavirus. Attacks, attackers are exploiting the situation, so look out for phishing emails and scams. We should be very suspicious of mails from people you don't know, especially if they ask to connect to links or open files. Mails that create an image of urgency or severe consequences of key candidates for phishing. It's like uh, asking for your credit card uh, details and all that. Immediately, you should be able to verify by phone if possible. Next slide, please. So, what are the generic top security tips, tips for the participants? You should be able to use a trusted VPN. VPN. And uh, you should be able to secure physical as well as digital assets. Avoid public Wi-Fi. Ensure antivirus software is up to date in your devices. And make sure that devices and OS are up to date. And encrypt the hard drives. Ensure that staff know how to report suspicious activity. Provide communication and training on how to deal with such incidents. And use collaboration tools to mitigate this cybersecurity risk. Next slide, please. I think the last slide is missing. Uh, anyway, uh, now at IIDT, what we did is that we have uh, uh, asked all the employees and the including the all the stakeholders, including the faculty and students, to work from home and access to, uh, secure access to the applications and to the training material that has become a key consideration for us. As the situation is evolving, even the education sector also might need a dedicated CEO CISO in the times to come. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Malikarjan. Mr. Krishna Mohan, we are eagerly awaiting now for the industry perspective from you. Thank you, sir. Uh, um, hello, all. Uh, this is Krishna from Inspirex. Uh, I would take 10 minutes of time uh, to briefly uh, talk about how the IT industry has responded to this uh, COVID-19 uh, lockdown situation. Um, I, I would like to thank uh, uh, especially the state government administration of uh, Andhra Pradesh, Sundar Sir, uh, Sir, as well as the uh, It's really amazing to see how the government is competing with the private sector in applying technology. This is really encouraging. So uh, when it comes to IT sector, uh, IT sector per se works um, virtually. Most of um, uh, the operations happen virtually. So it's a kind of impact test for us. Uh, I would like to uh, talk about how, uh, in reference to our company, Inspired, which is uh, um, a general representation of how the entire industry responded in Andhra Pradesh to this COVID situation. So we have four slides. I will talk about uh, each uh, different key transforming factors, how uh, we applied uh, to handle this scenario. Next slide, please. Uh, 
So uh, the first thing uh, we adopted, of course, is uh, rapid changes in digital infrastructure. As such, we work um, with our clients that are uh, located across the world, so in different time zones. So we already have a setup, but then we have a group of our employees working from one location while the other 20% or 30% of our employees are working from different locations. So we already have that setup. We needed to prove how fast we are scalable to scatter these 80% of uh, employees to go home or to go to places that are safe and start working from their remote. So that needed digital infrastructure. So mm, we live in technology every moment. So and we tried to test that, how rapidly we could expand that to facilitate this work from home uh, uh, you know, uh, setup. So this required uh, quickly uh, you know, setting up of uh, tools, uh, collaborative uh, unified communication tools, um, and then um, applying the, uh, the geofencing technology and uh, applying IoT, Internet of Things, um, to collaborate with our uh, teams across uh, different locations. So uh, if we see how we initially acted upon um, uh, you know, uh, enabling the uh, employees seamlessly working uh, on their uh, assignments, you see um, the HR has played a very key role uh, in you know, creating group discussions. On Since we don't have SOPs for uh, handling this scenario, we have SOPs, standard operating uh, procedures, but uh, a scenario like this was never um, included in our business continuity plan. So it required a special attention uh, for almost all managers to, to understand how we are going to deal with it without impacting operations. So uh, I would say um, everything happened virtually, while uh, in the previous uh, scenario, certain things happened in physical presence. For example, onboarding of employees, uh, we have um, uh, client meetings, you know, where the team come together and then talk about uh, the client requirements. And all that happened using virtual platforms. And the platforms we used are mostly the kind of you know, uh, uh, tools that collaborate to uh, tools that we used. Google Meet that you see on uh, the slide here. Um, but we have also considered the sensitivity of several tools in terms of cybersecurity. For example, we all know what happened uh, while using Zoom. Uh, even uh, Indian government has uh, suggested that we may stay away from Zoom. I don't know what happened, but uh, it is considered to be uh, less secure uh, in terms of, uh, I mean, cybersecurity aspects. So we quickly adapted. So we were uh, Zoom customers for almost uh, five years. Uh, we have a corporate license, and we had to switch to uh, Skype for Business, Google Meet, and uh, Microsoft Teams. So these are the things we quickly adapted. The infrastructure has been uh, mobilized to uh, different centers, and our IT team has uh, uh, enabled these things, you know, uh, which are already existing, uh, uh, a micro offices kind of a model we implemented. Next slide, please. So uh, then comes, so since we have all the setup in place, we quickly you know, set it up across all uh, homes. We have uh, close to 300 employees working from the uh, chat uh, And around 20 to 30 employees working from different locations, including US and different cities in India. Uh, so they already have that setup. So these guys, these 300 folks don't have it. So there's a kind of a, a panic situation created uh, so, which required all our leadership team uh, to come online, conduct meetings, make sure that we sensitize our employees not to become panic, because the psyche of uh, individual employees quickly changed. You know, so they were not able to handle certain uh, mission critical operations uh, for the clients uh, that are sitting across the world. So, it required a huge um, model to be built across all teams and. That was managed by the leadership as well as HR uh, teams by conducting the periodic sessions on uh, giving updates on COVID-19, uh, clarifying their apprehensions. And that's where the state government initiatives really helped us. So we, we referred to state government uh, activities. Andhra has been one of the 
20 years of uh, adapting technologies and then thanks to the current leadership uh, it really helped us you know to track uh, the current scenario at district level and uh, you know uh, each region level identifying the clusters we have uh, employees located in different clusters so we we identified and we even shuffled the teams for example team a has a certain number of employees located in different zones where the zones are categorized into red or green or orange and then we had to regroup these teams into uh, to suit the uh, current uh, no lockdown scenario so that if needed they can probably meet once in the local office and then have a quick uh, conversation so um, the hr and leadership played a key role in building this model uh, to make sure that the job security is uh, provided to all these people so that you know, a lot of apprehensions you know uh, many small and medium firms started uh, sending notices okay guys you now we're unable to continue operations and uh, you may not be able to continue the service kind of a message so luckily at inspired we continued our operations where uh, we've been used to this work from uh, remote location model and that helped us uh, you know continue the operations without any impact and our clients across the world also supported us in fact we are into telecom uh, industry and telecom industry has been in uh, great demand and as we all see you know that's enabling this uh, uh, current digital uh, approach to managing covid uh, pandemic so um, basically you know hr and leadership really played a key role and that's what we talk about in slide 2 next slide please so this is uh, an important thing you know this um, this is really tricky one so we we had to disconnect on site operations and that required uh, a lot of uh, thinking certain customers uh, wanted our employees to be on site to manage their infrastructure we are into managed services so and if they are not available on site and we, even if our employees are not available on site their uh, customer location becomes uh, very vulnerable for uh, you know down times so we had to really work on this uh, with a complete uh, you know uh, transformation of uh, vpn uh, setup you know van lan setup with uh, you know the Uh, the management of firewalls that needed to be reconfigured, and then we also needed the client approvals on reconfiguring the VPNs and all that. This is a huge uh, effort. Uh, luckily, you know, thanks to the telecom revolution in India, uh, we were able to still operate the VPNs even from our remote uh, desk using the 4G network. So, and our IT team really supported uh, these things by. physically moving the hardware where needed by maintaining uh, all the protocols of covid-19 um lockdown and uh, made sure that this um, hardware setup is done at each location and uh, they set up the vpns quickly and then they they were able to connect to the terminal services to our client location so disconnecting on site connecting online of course is uh, uh, normal but the new normal here is that you know uh, it happened with the rapid uh, transformation at individual level so it's a collaborative approach where you know your high performance computing comes into picture uh, hpc modeling was done and uh, we needed to make sure that there's no overloading there's no uh, scalability impact so all these things were uh, addressed while uh, creating this uh, online setup for individuals uh, we we really had to uh, learn uh, several uh, new things while doing this uh, but thanks to mobile revolution in india that really helped us uh, manage this we applied iot also in, in the process here next slide please i think this is the previous slide yeah so this is uh, again uh, uh, while uh, the lockdown extended for the the first month was okay the second month uh, we started finding you know the 
the uptime of employees, you know, for example, uh, each employee is expected to deliver six hours of effort and they log in. We have collaborative uh, tracking tools and all that. So we started seeing uh, uh, you know, very different uh, patterns of this productivity across our team, uh, which would obviously impact our uh, billing and revenue. So we had to bring in the HR uh, with a new approach uh, to make sure that they, they have uh, new initiatives such as, you know, we, we have uh, created an online radio where all the employees, they tune in and we have an update about the company. They have some uh, online uh, contests, online uh, collaborative uh, uh, events happening through HR managers to make sure that they also engage the family members of employees. Um, so that they don't feel they're isolated uh, virtually. So this is a very important activity, uh, which most of uh, the IT companies adapted because you know, that's the only way that we can still connect with um, employees to keep their morale high. So it's all about people management, mostly beyond technology in IT industry, because IT technology is already there and you just need to create an, uh, you know, a rapidly uh, uh, rapid response to our technology environment. So we were able to do that with the help of uh, several uh, uh, support measures uh, taken up by the local administration. For example, the, uh, the volunteer system has been phenomenal, I would say, because uh, we have uh, everything available locally. We have the information available on hand on the mobile. And we have the e-pass that really helped us. Now we we had to take we we simply applied uh, for e-pass online, uh, and then we got it without any uh, difficulty. So um, thanks to uh, the chief minister and the state administration, amazing uh, way they managed uh, to see the minimal impact on the IT industry. And uh, usually we run cabs. We have our transport of employees uh, door to door for 24-7 operations. Even uh, for those things, uh, we, we had uh, mm, I don't know, no difficulty in initial times, but then we decided to stop all that. It's now 90% work from home, 10% uh, working from uh, our uh, local uh, you know, uh, cluster offices. We have two, three offices in Vishakhapatnam where not more than 15 people assemble uh, by maintaining social distance just in case they have to collaborate together to, to talk to all our employees. Uh, so I, I, I made my presentation very generic because you know, there's nothing much about technology. I'm really surprised to see Sundar Sarth's presentation on uh, uh, the modeling. And you know, there's a lot of uh, uh, you know, modeling and technology being adopted at every level, uh, you know, both the private sector and also in the government. So with this um, few notes, as such, uh, the whole industry is going through the sensitivity of business itself, then operations. So that is where uh, now we are all uh, keeping our fingers crossed. But at Inspire uh, we are proud to say that we were able to keep our customers happy. And then we have 100% uh, attention of the customers uh, so far. As the extension of this lockdown continues, uh, we probably don't know. We have to do some modeling in business as well. Uh, but then this looks like um, pretty much managed so far uh, without uh, major impact. And I really appreciate uh, Professor um, uh, Professor JP and Professor Sundar and then uh, the entire team for conducting this seminar, which will help us uh, uh, take away some uh, good things about managing uh, um, this uh, no, pandemic scenarios. Uh, I wanted to tell one last thing. Um, uh, what made us to be more resilient uh, towards such kind of scenarios? There was um, there was a huge storm that came into our city in 2014. Uh, a storm hood hood, where all our operations were disrupted in uh, less than and without any uh, no preparedness. But uh, Inspired uh, was able to manage uh, the operations or resume operations within 14 hours by sending all our employees to different locations where there was no impact like Vijaywada, Rajamandi and all that. So we had this work from uh, different locations set up 
uh, that happened in 2014, which helped as a test case for us. So okay, uh, at a bigger scale, we did this time. Uh, with this, uh, I conclude my presentation and uh, thank everyone for giving this opportunity. The way forward is, you know, I, as I mentioned in my slide, um, we are definitely looking forward to seeing an end to this uh, uh, pandemic situation the next three, four months, but beyond four months, we don't know resilience, but we are prepared for next four months. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Krishna. Thank you. We have yeah. a couple of questions and want to be mindful of, of everyone's time. Uh, first question is for Krishna as to whether there are any um, challenges with rural areas that had um, lower Wi-Fi or wireless coverage. Uh, that, yeah, so that's a very important uh, point, uh, Jean. Uh, so um, that's what I was saying. Luckily, we are in a city where most of the locations are covered with 4G network. So we had no issues, but there's some areas where we had uh, issues. So we requested the employees. Uh, we, we have taken some guest houses, uh, which are properly maintained and all that. So we very few of them were asked to move there use the Wi-Fi dongles and uh, we created an environment temporarily so that no, we, we transitioned their work to other employees so that we let them go back to their uh, uh, homes. So uh, we have some 10% of employees uh, still unable to connect uh, efficiently because of their locational constraints. Uh, that is still there because of uh, the uh, tower, uh, I know efficiencies, uh, tower connectivities uh, that are locally available uh, we don't have a solution for that um, other than you know moving them to a better location in case we need their services but we we chose the alternative way of transitioning their job to uh, the other employees within the organization thank you question krishna another interesting question was from mr lankaretti i believe who asked um in regard to different states have differing uh, levels of, of, of testing and how the, the mathematical models from the different states are, are reconciled for a to make a national model. And, and Sundar, do you have a comment on that? Sir, by design, by design, the models are state agnostic. By design, the models are geography agnostic. All we require is the data to arrive at the basic refraction number to arrive at uh, the various metrics which I just mentioned. So the model which I described, in short, is agnostic to geography and other local issues. I hope that answers the question. Uh, I, I think so. I, I think part of the question was that the amount of testing varies by state or region. So the, the baseline data is different, whether that might affect the, the models. That, that is true. When baseline data is different, we have to change the basic parameters of the model to ensure that the uh, data is accommodated. That is, we do it in the data cleaning process. Uh, I did not touch too much on the data cleaning process because I was concentrating more on the basic model. Once data is used, this kind of cleaning and cleansing will be done to ensure that the data is fit for the model. Also, in most of the most of these kind of uh, usages, it is uh, always assumed that whatever the data that we have is so. Our assumption is that is the level of infection as of now. So, because I mean, of course, testing has a huge effect on the number of uh, infections. So that's that's given. But uh, given that, given the data that we have, all the models are based on that. And of course, uh, some level of uh, extrapolation is there, but that's that's all that we can achieve as of now. Thank you, Anna Um With that, if there, there aren't any more questions, I'll, I'll pass it along to uh, Sundar to, to provide a closing. Uh, so no, we close. Okay. Uh, dear panelists, it has been a very invigorating evening for me and you and the audiences here. Uh, we had designed this uh, seminar keeping in mind the various 
stakeholders involved. We wanted voices from the government. We wanted good representation from the academia. We also wanted the industry to tell what we have been doing for the state and for the country in controlling the pandemic. And in this journey, I am really thankful to Professor Ji for helping me and cobbling together this varied stakeholders into this seminar. I thank all the panelists individually and also together from the International Institute of Digital Technologies, of which I represent as its head, for giving us this inputs. And one thing I did not mention at the beginning was our student community at IITT are also logged on to this. And they are also very much benefited by this, uh, by, by, by this unique conglomeration of industry, academia, and uh, the government. So thank you once again for giving us this opportunity. Professor Jean, I personally want to thank you on this forum and place my appreciation and uh, gratitude for whatever you did in getting this alive. Thank you very much once again. Yeah, uh, thank you, Sundar, and thank you, Mr. Sashidar Kriyasagar. Uh, Anirban, Malika Jura, and, and Krishnan for your talks. Thank you all for, for joining today. And uh, our, our next uh, webinar in the series uh, on technology and teacher response to coronavirus is going to be on Thailand in partnership with Thomas Hart University and the National Science and Technology Development Agency of the Thailand government. So look forward to the possibility of seeing you then. And many, many thanks to uh, Sundar Balakrishna and our Indian colleagues. So thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, JP. Thank you. Thank you. Sir, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.